Can I welcome you to the second session today of the House of Lords Public Services Committee on Access to Emergency Services. We have two um, further witnesses now. Um, Dr. Adrian Boyle, who is President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Welcome, um, Dr. Boyle. And Professor Julia Williams, who is Professor of Paramedic Science and Associate Dean um, of Research at the University of Hertfordshire. Welcome to both of you. Um, you have seen that we are trying to get to the bottom of just what the systems <coughs> deliver in the United Kingdom, but particularly in England, and how we affect systems in order to ensure more effective emergency access for patients. So um, we're really uh, grateful to you uh, for coming um, along, and we're particularly looking in this evidence session to explore concerns that we've heard about those systemic issues leading to challenges in emergency services in hospitals and ambulance services, alongside training, skills, best practice and learning, and changing demand. Uh, some of those were covered in the last session, but we want to look at them with you too. And I want to open the questioning by asking that, considering the challenges throughout our health systems, what changes do you think are needed to address the high levels of demand and capacity challenges in urgent and emergency care? And who should really be pushing forward these big picture changes? OK, thank you. Um, so the big issue that we've got, we've got a number of issues. The reasons we're seeing these very long um, delays to offloading ambulances and handover delays um, is because our hospitals are full and um, it is not because the demand has gone up. And I think just it might be worth just trying to unpick right. given the previous session and try and explain some of the demand. So if you look at um, what's called hospital episode statistics about the number of people who are going to emergency departments, it does show a increase. However, the majority of that increase is accounted for in people going to uh, the increases in type 2 and type 3 emergency departments. So these are urgent treatment centres, eye units, minor injuries units. The number of people going to type 1 emergency departments, what you would, everyone recognises, the major emergency departments, has stayed pretty static for about the last two or three years. There are areas where it goes a little bit up, where you've got an increased population growth or where there's been a merger of a hospital. Our problem is really not around increased demand. Our big problem is about length of stay within emergency departments and the in, uh, inability to admit people into hospitals. So our problems are largely all about the flow through emergency departments. Waiting times, I was very interested in the discussion that we had in the previous session about waiting times. Um, there is a problem, particularly in England, to a great extent and to a lesser extent in Wales, with the recording of very long stays in emergency departments. So the re monthly reporting form performance statistics that come out of NHS England includes something called a 12-hour decision to admit metric. That is taken from the time where a clinician decides that a patient should be admitted to hospital. And this has been often several hours after the person arrived. <coughs> I agree with uh, Lord Bichot, um, and pretty much everyone who thinks about this problem in any way is clear that actually it doesn't matter when that decision to admit is made. What really actually matters is how long the patient's been waiting in an emergency department. Um, this has been routine in a number of years in Northern Ireland and Scotland and is a much more robust measure. The consequence of using a DTA metric, the decision to admit metric, is it underestimates and conceals the true scale of the problem. We think it underestimates um, the scale of people who are suffering long stays in emergency departments. So in August 22, 10% of all attendances to type 1 emergency departments spent longer than 12 hours from time of arrival. If you look at the DTA metric, that was 2%. So it's underestimating it fivefold. So um, this metric is collected, 
it is reported centrally to NHS England, but is not published routinely alongside other performance statistics. It's only published once a year. Um, we've campaigned for a long time around meaningful metrics because this provides better operational intelligence and provides a better a appreciation across the system about the level of risk and demand and problems within the system. Crikey. <laughs> Pretty devastating. Sorry, I mean, it's devastating. Yeah. Pretty devastating what you just said, isn't it? Because, as I said earlier, the great British public think it's one thing; it's actually far worse. Yes, it it, it is. Um, we are also in a situation now where people are spending a lot longer in emergency departments than we've ever seen. In 2015, a 12-hour DTA breach, 12 <coughs> was actually it was so uncommon. Yes, people used to get very excited about it but it wasn't that much of a problem because we weren't having these long 12-hour stays. And I think it's important to recognise the situation we've got with delayed handover, um, hand, hand, handover delays is a relatively new problem. And certainly it's new to be in this scale. Now, the problems that led to this were there before COVID. I don't think it is reasonable to suggest this is entirely driven by COVID. I think a lot of the problems were there, but COVID accelerated it. Okay. Behind this, we are running our hospitals fuller, our acute hospitals fuller than we've seen ever before. So in September, we, rec uh, we recorded the highest level of occupancy we've ever recorded since records began at 93.6%. Um, it is fairly clear from international comparisons that hospitals should aim to run their, um, ca their capacity with an uncontrolled system um, at about 85% capacity. In the UK, we're particularly bad at using our capacity well because we have an addiction to open bays, which means the capacity can be used less flexibly. We quite rightly don't put women next to men in hospitals. That, that is quite right. Um, and if we get an infection control outbreak, either COVID or flu or winter vomiting virus, then that bay can be used much less flexibly. So. Our open bays that we have in our hospitals are a particular problem for capacity. Um, I heard in the previous session there was a, lot, a bit about demand. There is a particular area of demand where we think there can be improvements, and that is around the um, NHS 111 and the, and the systems within NHS 111 and the risk that is carried and shared or exported by NHS 111. NHS 111 is a little bit too siloed. Um, it would be much more effective if it was given higher level, uh, better access to clinicians to support. If you have an untrained call handler or an unsupported non-clinical call handler, inevitably they're going to call an ambulance or they're going to direct somebody to emergency department or general practice. Triage is a difficult, valuable clinical skill that I think we need to value more. And making those decisions over the telephone can be quite difficult and requires experience. <coughs> Where we have, there's reasonably good evidence where you get a clinician into a, a NHS 1 call, 1 1 call centre, you can reduce an awful lot of um, referrals to a higher levels of care. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Julia, can you? Yes, I, I think um, Adrian's covered quite a lot of what I was going to say there. So. Um, it, just to say that uh, whilst I work in the University of Hertfordshire, I've been involved in pre-registration and post-registration education of paramedics for since 1996. Um, and I have a joint appointment because I'm also a paramedic and I work in South East Coast Ambulance where I head up research and undertake clinical shifts. So I, for me, this, it, 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 as, as over the last three weeks you've been hearing, mm -hmm about the, the diversity of roles of paramedics. And I do really want to stress that, that whilst we're talking a lot about ambulance services, um, we have paramedics working in urgent care centres, EDs, heart attack centres, um, hospices. Um, we, we've started to see specialities such as uh, paramedics working in frailty, which I think is particularly significant in terms of the sort of things we're trying to achieve. Um, throughout the whole healthcare system and social care. We, we cannot divorce social care from, from some of the challenges we're having today. Um, 
So I think paramedics over the, well, really since, since the 1980s, we have moved from an, an ambulance transport system to a system of um, determining what happens to the patient based on their need. So diagnostic reason, <coughs> and that involves um, education. And it's been a slow process, as you would expect, to transition uh, to becoming a, a, a point of entry now, a BSC <coughs> honours. That, I think, is, is um, something that's really going to advantage the situations we're in, because, as Adrian was saying, I mean, things like telephone triage is, is incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not something, I, I have done it myself and I would far rather see my patient face to face. So there are real skills there to, that, that we are largely giving to um, an unregistered workforce. So by bringing in specialists from whatever profession, and, and, and at that point it could be nursing, it could be medicine, um, and certainly it could be paramedic because our advanced scope of practice, we tend to, to at the moment, it's quite dichotomized, either into critical care um, or into more primary care in the ambulance service. That isn't the same outside of the ambulance service where, where we've got some fantastic clinicians developing um, as advanced clinical practitioners who are contributing um, to really, hopefully, adding to minimizing the problems with the workflow through the hospitals. Um, so I think we've got a role right at the front end. Um, we've got a role in terms of, as, as you heard Darren say, about see, uh, hear and treat and see and treat. Again, skills that have to be developed, and, and that is advanced skills. And it's those practitioners who are supporting our frontline ambulance staff who are going to... Um, it, that's why they came into, into the job, isn't it? They, they, they're attracted to undifferentiated presentations, that sort of environment. But of course, what we have seen, um, and that's what we're talking about today, is the challenges of then moving from perhaps spending anything from 20 minutes to two hours with a patient, depending where you're working in the country, because obviously you've got much longer running times in rural areas. Um, but to move that to 12 hours, and maybe only seeing one of your patient groups in, in, in one or two per shift actually does require a transition. Um, and it's great to hear that there are, and I am going to, hopefully we'll talk about this notion of pilots later on, um, because for me, absolutely, um, evidence-based and research is the way forward. And it depends what we're talking about when we're saying a pilot. But there have been lots of these um, new roles since 2003, we've had community care paramedics. We've had research where a district nurse goes out with a paramedic in a vehicle. So some of these things are not new. They've just not been developed. Um, and in terms of the district nurse going out uh, with, with a paramedic or, or a community nurse as is now, um, you have to question whether you need two, two practitioners of that level doing that. Absolutely, mental health totally different. Um, midwifery is totally different. Working joint, jointly with the uh, police services, so a, a police officer and a paramedic in a car. But what we don't want to do is duplicate expertise, and you're, we don't want to see sort of two highly qualified practitioners um, going to the same patient when one person could probably do that. The other area I think we need to look at is care homes, um, because there are significant calls that are related to elderly people who've fallen in care homes and you will see horrifying statistics of how long they've been left on the floor. Um, and, you know, it's that, that, I think, is we have to look at the risk ratio and the risk benefit there as, as to how we develop staff in care homes to perhaps manage um, a, a full non-injury. And I say that cautiously because, for me, actually, you've still got to have the skills to be sure that they are a non-injury. Um, mm. that patient. You can't just whip them up off the floor and, uh, yeah. Mm. So maybe, maybe a greater use of, of um, technology and video to actually have some of our experienced clinicians who are in the hubs seeing that patient and then helping um, to do that sort of thing. But that's areas of research that are going on 
and unfortunately research takes such a long time and maybe that's how we have to expedite some of those things. Just, uh, I have declared all my interest at the start of the sessions, but just for not losing track of it, I'm a non-exec director of a company that does have a lot of care homes. All right. Um, it's not their main function, but it's one of their functions. Uh, we, I need to talk to you then. <laughs> well, we wouldn't be letting staff willy-nilly handle people like that because we'd end up with a bunch of angry relatives coming in trying to sue us for everything we're worth because that's the litigious nature of the world we live in at the moment. Mm. So there'd have to be something that made sure that the staff and the organisations were properly insured against that risk, and I'm not sure the government would stand up to that. I'm not suggesting that we would do anything like that, whether we work with the, the fire service authorities or our community first responders. There's got to be clinical governance packed in around that, hasn't there? Because it's still got to be safe. Um, yeah. and, and that might mean maybe a better working relationship with some of the care homes. Uh, and it may not be possible, but I think it's areas that we have to look at. Yeah. And then the primary care people working Absolutely. with it. I do have one the, yeah. at the back of my, where I live now, and that's basically got an ambulance there all the time. Oh. It, it just con constantly they'll be getting people for one reason or another, blue lighting it down there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very, very, very quickly. Um, it's been suggested to us in one piece of evidence that the real problem is the length of time that's being spent out there on an instant. And that's what's keeping, I'm just repeating this to you, so you can say it's a little rubbish or <laughs> you're on, or we should be onto something. Uh, and the problem with that, of course, is that ambulances are out on one call longer than they used to be, therefore they're not available to get back and start another call. And it's not so much a level of demand, as we were hearing before, um, but it's the time spent at an instant. Do you agree with that, or you think it's a load of rubbish? Well, I don't think it's a load of rubbish, but I don't agree with it in terms of taking it as a face value statement. Um, it depends what is being done at that call. Mm -hmm. So if someone is going there, if I go there as, as a, a clinician mm -hmm. and I'm doing a full patient history, full patient assessment, and with a view, because none of us want to take people into hospital unless they need to go. And there is a, a, a proportion of patients that have to go to hospital. Um, so in a time critical incident, I think those are the ones, so um, if obviously stroke, um, <coughs> heart attack, obviously it's some of those sort of presentations. Has the time taken has increased over the last five years? It has, but then what we've got to look at is in doing that, have we safely left a growing number of people at home? Mm -hmm. And from the statistics that are given to us, uh, that have been given to you over the last couple of weeks, you know, it's varying between 50 and 70 percent, and we can, you always have to say 50 and 70 percent of what. But if we are successfully either directing patients into a more appropriate care pathway or safely leaving them at home with community support, that isn't something that we can do in 20 minutes. So at one point, you know, we were, we were given an average of 20, 25 minutes per patient. Um, because this, this question came up last time, and mm. it's not a judgment of the length of time people spend there, because no, no. maybe the better outcomes medically are achieved. I think that you, everybody can see that. I think the challenge is the system hasn't, doesn't seem to acknowledge that if you spend twice as long at an event, you're probably going to attend half the number of events. And the system doesn't yeah. seem to have compensated. And it's great for the person who's treated but it may not be for the person who's laying on the floor for 23 hours, as an, the worst case example. I mean, I, I think the, the reports that I see from various ambulance trucks around the wasted, what they call, um, with no sense of irony, the wasted patient hours that they spent outside emergency departments would easily pay back that time for a little mm. bit more investment. So I think if there was flow into the emergency departments and through the emergency departments, we'll be able to fill up ambulances and, and they could go and spend double the amount of time. And, and I get that, but that suggests there was double the capacity they needed before these, this started deteriorating. I think actually all that's happened is the queues got longer. But that's not what the demand curve says. No, we say. Hang on. Yeah, you mm. did say it, demand wasn't the issue. But anyway, um, we need to move on. Kath. Pinnock. Thank you. Um, we've had a fascinating session, and last week as well, and hearing 
about good ideas for improving service from different providers, <coughs> be it the ambulance, as the chief exec we've heard today, or um, yourselves, and, and last week as well. So there's lots of these pilots around, lots of these good ideas around. I mean, you've brought up one or two today about a clinician in the, within the call centre. So the challenge is, how do you evaluate them? And then if they're a goer, how do you get it out so that it's everyone can benefit? I think you've hit on a really important problem for the NHS. The NHS is, um, certainly I've seen a number of pilots, quite important big pilots mm -hmm. that have been done, which have had a lack of commitment to evaluate. Oh. <laughs> That's ours. <laughs> I need to see it. 